The year is 1998. The shooter-oriented corner of the video game industry is advancing rapidly with the release of Quake 2, Hexen 2, Unreal, and Tom Clancy's Rainbow Six. How do you capitalize on the growing hype around fully rendered 3D environments and enemies? Release a 2.5D shooter on the build engine several years too late, I guess? To be fair, the story of Nam is more complex than just poor timing or judgement. After all, a game like that doesn't just pop up overnight. It does tell a somewhat sad story at the end of the build engine's lifespan, following a strong catalogue of games. And Redneck Rampage. And Tech War. The build engine was coded by Ken Silverman, created for use by 3D Realms, and went on to power 15 separate games. For the time, that's a pretty impressive spread. The biggest of these titles are Duke Nukem 3D, Blood, and Shadow Warrior, with Redneck Rampage technically rounding it out to four, depending on which critic you happen to ask on any given day. Interestingly enough, the first build engine game wasn't actually Duke 3D, but rather an unreleased Taiwanese game by the name of Legend of the Seven Paladins, which eventually leaked to the internet in various stages of production, and that was as early as 1994. So when Duke came around in 1996, several other games built off of that code, including Redneck Rampage. This trend continued to include the games we're focusing on today, NOM, and World War II GI. Interestingly enough, the games built from scratch and build tend to be seen in a more positive light than those built off of Duke 3D code directly. I'm hesitant to call this a coincidence. Among the Duke code-based games, just so happens to be Extreme Paint Brawl, which regularly makes the internet rounds as one of the worst first-person shooters to ever grace a monitor, along with Redneck Rampage and Redneck Deer Hunting, the latter of which simply runs off with the Redneck Engine, which makes it built on top of a game, on top of a game, and now I'm starting to get queasy. Then again, the custom-built side includes William Shatner's Tech War, so win some, lose some. We're here to talk about the end of the build engine's life cycle, though, so we'll start with Nam. Chances are you may have played this game before it hit store shelves, since it started as a Duke 3D total conversion called Platoon, presumably suffering a commercial name change to avoid catching copyright flag. You can still find Platoon on the mod database, and there's one very cheeky comment noting how Platoon can be run as an add-on for Nam, which is making me crazy again. Nam is straightforward, but not always in a good way. You play a lieutenant on active duty in the Vietnam War who often winds up stuck behind enemy lines with nothing but a gun and some over-enthusiastic voice lines to get him through the night. Much like Duke, you get quips here and there, and you even start levels off with this trademark knuckle-cracking routine, but that's about as far as similarities go. For starters, Nam is not actually fun to play, like you would approach Duke 3D. If you run into a firefight, you're going to be turned into chunky salsa by enemies with hitscan weapons and laser accuracy far beyond the point where you can only see them as a blurred cluster of pixels. It's one of the few build engine shooters that expects you to hunker down and approach fights slowly and methodically. In this engine, that's just not very satisfying, but less because of personal preference and more due to the engine just not feeling up to the task. Generally, a methodical playthrough of a tactical shooter means you take your time, sweep your corners, and clear out enemies in a predictable pattern to reduce your exposure to enemy fire. The Vietnam War, on the other hand, involved a lot of booby traps, ambushes, and if this game is to be believed, being bombed by your own fighter jets more often than the enemy. If friendly fire were a currency, this game would have suffered Zimbabwe levels of hyperinflation. Combine this with a tendency to spawn in extra enemies after you hit certain points in a level, and you've got the recipe for a game that doesn't really lend itself well to tactical play. Add on top of that a general disdain for bullets, as you can only take between three to six shots depending on body armor and other factors like difficulty before dying, and you have a game that seems made specifically to encourage its players to never actually play it. So it's bad, right? Well, not exactly. Truth be told, there's something to be said for Team TNT trying something different in a genre that primarily focused on run-and-gun action. The atmosphere Nam creates is oppressive and induces paranoia. Every tree could hide the enemy, and every bullet you take could very well be your last. You never truly know if a jet flying overhead or the distant pound of mortars firing will hit your enemy or land squarely on your position. It's probably as close to a PTSD simulator as 1998 could hope to produce. 
The level design isn't perfect, but they did attempt to make the rivers and jungles feel like wide open spaces after the first stage or two, but they also knew when to reduce the scope of a level to give you a claustrophobic bit of tree line to creep through. I don't know if a copyright safe MIDI version of Paint It Black by the Rolling Stones works best here, but it certainly sets the mood. Unsurprisingly, critics of the time weren't kind to Nam. When the gaming public at large frothed at the mouth for more 3D, they got this instead. There you are, Sergeant. We've been attacked by the 4th MVA Regiment, but now they're pulling back thanks to you. Get to the M113 in the jungle. Take 30 clicks north. And then gaming magazines responded accordingly. It was deemed an archaic reminder of why games had moved away from the build engine, even at its budget price of $20 that swiftly nosedived into the bargain bin, if the eDuke32 page is anything to go by. It was at least recognized for its attempts to capture realism in an engine that also played host to Duke's alien slaughtering one-liner bravado, but its atmosphere and tone are about all it has going for it at this point, truth be told. Yet at the same time, I feel compelled to recommend it as something to try for anyone interested in the history of shooters, different engines, or just masochists with plenty of free time and nothing to do with it. If you run it through eDuke32, it actually becomes playable thanks to the upscaling involved that makes enemies more visible, and the addition of mouse aiming that no longer leaves you quite so vulnerable to being shot in the back of the head. Does that make it good? Nope. Makes it something worth trying out of painful curiosity, though. So the era of the build engine has come and gone. Naturally, a year later, Team TNT tried again with World War II GI, like very sane and reasonable developers. The result is somehow worse. It's not good. It is so far away from good that it needs a word to describe just how miserable it is to play. The first scenario drops you into the Normandy Beach campaign of World War II that is essentially a meat grinder made out of machine guns. And you get to be the meat. When you leave your landing craft, you die. When you enter a foxhole, you die. When you poke your head up to try and thin out the machine gun nests, you die. When you cower next to a medic for slow, painful healing, you fall deeply in love, daydream about how your lives will improve once you've freed France from the Nazi regime, and are able to live quieter, simpler lives on the riverfront with nothing but your medic partner and a glass of Normandy wine. And then you die. But in all seriousness, it's got the same issues as Nam, but the method in which they present it makes its problems all the worse. You're constantly out of ammo, your weapons are as inaccurate as spraying hipfire downrange likely would be in real life, your enemies all have bionic sniper scopes drilled into their foreheads, and only the blood of dead Americans can fuel their murderous rampage. It's ridiculously punishing, and making an inch of progress feels like an outright miracle, but chances are any progress you make will soon be lost as soon as your gun runs dry and you're shot down as you make a desperate sprint towards the front lines with a knife brandished in your third hand. I, I don't know why this happens. I don't think anyone played this game long enough to see it. The second campaign is more reasonable, and I was able to make it through the first stage at the grueling par time of around 20 minutes, which the game promptly mocked me over by claiming a par of 7 minutes would have been much more realistic. If anyone has beaten this stage in 7 minutes, I imagine they've either taken Adderall to the point of zen-like focus, or they fell through the level and landed in the level end trigger. There's cover to take, and you aren't charging up a mine-laden, barbed wire covered hill, but that's the nicest thing I can say about it. Most of the core team seems to be the same, though the director did swap out from Dante Anderson to David Nottingham, but it's nearly impossible to tell why one went for atmosphere and tension while the other just wanted you to stare at a death screen instead of having fun. I cannot suggest anyone play World War II GI these days with any level of good conscience. It's slow, shooting people isn't any fun, and there's precious little to be gleaned unless you're studying up on the makings of poor level design. The end of the life cycle of the build engine is a mixed bag. Blood and Shadow Warriors release in 1997 would have been a perfect place to stop. Redneck Rampage was also a thing that happened in 1997. Then came Nam and Paint Brawl and things really took a turn for the worse, which put something of a damper on the legacy of one of the neatest 2.5D engines we ever got. Shame that's the end of things. Thank you for watching the first episode of DOS B-Sides. I have several other games on the back burner that pretty much nobody played, and I would love to talk about them in this kind of format. 
Uh, and that includes some big name titles that everyone played and some really crappy DOS era games that nobody's ever heard of, and maybe a few slightly beyond that. Uh, I also stream many of those games over on my Twitch channel, which I've linked down below, so you should come say hi and see me struggle to get through the minefields of Dark Forces or don't. Dark Forces is a really, really bad game these days, actually. It does not hold up well. Uh, the second one's not bad, though, but that's neither here nor there. I also have a Twitter where I cry about Dark Forces like a wee baby, too. Anyway, see you next time. <laughs>